The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. I start the program with a heavy heart and a heavy announcement. Uh, my Uncle Jack uh, passed away last night. He was 92 years old. Um, he loved this city, loved Abney, uh, and he was just a great, uh, he was a great man, a great New Yorker. He won uh, the Bronze Star uh, in World War II. Uh, as most of you know, he was uh, our chairman uh, of my family business, a civic leader, and a really an amazing philanthropist. Um, he was a founding member, along with my dad, of Abney, and uh, he will uh, be greatly missed. I'm sure one of you, some of you are wondering why, why I'm even up here, but he, uh, his theory was uh, work is good therapy, uh, so uh, I think this is part of uh, uh, the healing process, so uh, just like to do a moment of, of silence um, for, uh, for Uncle Jack. Thank you. Uh, it is now my uh, pleasure to introdu introduce our uh, speaker. Uh, and uh, Bill is an old friend, uh, a dedicated uh, public servant, uh, and uh, a great New Yorker. Uh, he serves as the president and CEO of uh, uh, the New York Fed. And as most of you know, uh, next week the FM FMOC will uh, be meeting uh, in Washington to discuss interest rates. Um, and today is literally the last day he can speak uh, uh, in public uh, before the blackout period. So we're truly honored to have uh, President Dudley here uh, before uh, joining uh, the Fed in uh, 2009. Uh, Bill served as chief economist at Goldman Sachs. Uh, he has an extensive background and practical knowledge of markets and policy making, uh, making him a strong and influential leader uh, that, uh, that is so important uh, during these uh, complex economic uh, times. We look forward to hearing from Bill today on the current out outlook of the city's economy and our national economy and how we can move together uh, uh, and grow uh, our jobs uh, here in the city and throughout the country, and maybe he'll give us a little uh, insight into uh, the meeting uh, next week. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Dudley. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to be here today to talk about uh, the U.S. economic outlook, and I want to thank the Association for a Better New York uh, for sponsoring today's events. I think this is an excellent venue to speak about what we can do to improve our country's economic performance. Uh, as always, what I have to say today reflects my own views and opinions, and not necessarily those of the FOMC or the Federal Reserve System. So the U.S. economy, supported by solid gains in household spending, has expanded at a moderate rate in 2016. Job gains have been sturdy. We've seen some firming in wage growth uh, as the labor market has continued to tighten. Moreover, as the effects of earlier declines in energy prices has dissipated, the overall inflation rate has begun to rise again, up closer to our 2 percent objective. As a consequence, economic conditions are not far from the Federal Reserve's dual mandate of maximum sustainable employment uh, and price stability. And I expect we'll make further progress towards those twin goals in 2017. So from a cyclical perspective, the economy is in reasonably good shape. However, over the longer term, the U.S. economy does face significant challenges. Now, on the positive side, economic expansions don't just die off of old age, and there appear to be few imbalances uh, in the current economy that would cause the expansion to come to an early end. But in order for that to continue to remain the case, it's important that fiscal policy and monetary policy uh, be well aligned going forward. It's also important that the U.S. retain sufficient fiscal capacity 
so that fiscal policy can support the, the economy when the next downturn inevitably occurs. If fiscal policy can play a greater role in supporting macroeconomic stability, it would likely reduce the need for, monetary, for the monetary authorities to take extraordinary actions to support economic activity. There are also other important structural issues worth noting. In particular, productivity growth has been anemic over the past few years, while income inequality has increased and income mobility remains low. As a consequence, the gains in the sta standards of living generated by the current business expansion have been modest compared to previous expansions, and these gains have not been widely shared. Much more could be done both locally and nationally to increase the economy's potential so that it could perform better for a broader array of our citizens. So now let me go into a little bit more detail about the U.S. economic outlook. The U.S. economy has been expanding at a moderate rate, so growth has averaged 1.8 percent so far this year, and that seems to likely to continue at that pace or maybe a little bit firmer uh, in, in 2017. The main driver of growth this year has been the consumer, as real personal consumption expenditures have increased at a 2.9 percent annual rate during the first three quarters of the year. This solid consumption growth has been supported by sturdy job gains and rising nominal wages. Payroll gains have averaged about 180,000 per month this year, just what we got on Friday. While this is down somewhat from the 2015's monthly pace of nearly 230,000 jobs a month, it's still considerably higher than the 75 to perhaps 110,000 pace that would, consist, that would be consistent with the long-run growth rate of the labor force. And wage gains, while still relatively muted, have begun to rise more rapidly as the labor market has continued to tighten. Another positive factor for the economy is that household finances are generally in good shape. The household savings rate is 5.9 percent. That's actually a bit higher than one would expect based on historical relationships between household net worth and disposable income. And after a long period of deleveraging, household growth has started to grow again, but only very slowly. Over the last year, household debt has risen by 2.4 percent. This slow pace, combined with low borrowing rates and an improving labor market, have all helped push down the ratio of household debt service to income close to the lowest level since at least 1980. This suggests that households have the financial capacity to be able to sustain their spending. In contrast to consumer spending, many other areas of the economy have been considerably softer. Residential investment, after experiencing strong gains in 2015 and into the first quarter of 2016, fell during each of the past two quarters. However, here increases in single-family housing starts and permits in October suggest we're likely to reverse that trend in the fourth quarter and into the first part of next year. Business fixed investment has also been weak for some time. Part of this weakness reflects the collapse in oil and gas drilling activity following the plunge in crude oil prices that we saw during the second half of 2014. This adjustment now appears to be over as oil and gas prices have recovered somewhat. But even outside of this area, business fixed investment has been disappointing. Several factors may be at play here including earlier uncertainty surrounding the presidential election outcome and the fact that capacity utilization rates remain unusually low at this point in the economic business cycle. Now, while the election uncertainty has been resolved, I would expect business fixed investment to only rise slowly in the year ahead. In contrast, the trade sector has actually performed surprisingly well in 2016. This sector had to contend with significant headwinds created by weak growth in our foreign trading partners, as well as the impact of earlier dollar strength on the nation's export competitiveness. However, I'm not sure I would take much signal from this surprisingly good performance. The improvement in trade seems to be driven mainly by weakness in imports, particularly for capital goods, and by some special one-off factors. For example, we had a surge in soybean exports, exports last quarter, and that supported the overall trade numbers. Both of those are unlikely to continue. 
With respect to inflation, we're making progress in pushing towards our 2 percent objective. In particular, headline inflation has risen this year as the earlier declines that we saw in energy prices have dropped out of the year-over-year -year figures. And core inflation has remained broadly steady, running at a 1.7 percent rate over the past year, as measured by the personal consumption deflator that excludes food and energy. The stability in core PCE prices inflation is, is noteworthy because one might have anticipated that lower energy prices and a stronger dollar would have pushed core inflation a bit lower, but we haven't seen that. Also, household inflation expectations, which at times in 2015 appeared to be at risk of becoming unanchored to the downside, have been broadly stable. The University of Michigan long-term inflation expectations measure has generally remained in the, the range of recent years. And in addition, the New York Fed's survey of consumer expectations measure, this looks at three-year median inflation expectations, has stabilized in 2016 after declining modestly in 2014 and 15. Now, if the economy grows at a pace slightly above its sustainable long-term rate, as I expect, the labor market should gradually tighten further. And the resulting pressure on labor market resources should help push inflation towards our 2 percent objective over the next year or two. Assuming the economy stays on this trajectory, I would favor making monetary policy somewhat less accommodative over time by gradually pushing up the level of short-term interest rates. Now, following this year's election, we have seen relatively large movements in financial asset prices. In particular, the stock market's firmed, bond yields have risen, and the dollar has appreciated. On balance, it appears that financial market conditions have tightened modestly. My personal interpretation of these developments is that market participants now anticipate that fiscal policy will turn expansionary and that the FOMC will likely respond by tightening monetary policy a bit more quickly than previously anticipated. Assuming this expectation is real, realized, the recent modest tightening in financial market conditions seems broadly appropriate to me. <coughs> now, let me emphasize here that I do not view the recent shift in financial market conditions towards slightly more tightness as one that should prompt great concern. It's important to distinguish between a tightening of financial conditions that's driven by an increase in risk aversion from one that's driven by a greater likelihood of stronger near-term aggregate demand and less downside risks to the growth outlook. In the beginning of 2016, we experienced the former, an increase in risk aversion, while what's occurred more recently reflects current expectations of greater fiscal stimulus. Now, obviously, there's still considerable uncertainty about how fiscal policy will evolve over the next few years. We don't know what we're going to get, we don't know when it's going to occur, and we don't know how big it is. At this juncture, therefore, it's premature to reach firm conclusions about what will likely occur. As we get greater clarity about this over the coming year, I'm going to be updating my economic outlook, and with that, my views about the appropriate stance of monetary policy. Now, in my remarks today, I also want to talk a little bit about the limitations of monetary policy. One important factor contributing to such limits is that real short-term interest rates that are consistent in the long run with a neutral monetary policy stance appear to be very low compared to what they've been in the past, and this is expected to be, remain the case for some time in the future. This has been helping keep real inflation-adjusted interest rates lower than what we've seen historically. In part, the low level of interest rate reflects the anemic productivity growth, as well as the slowing that we've seen in labor force growth due to aging of the population. Now, an implication of being in this environment is that there will be less scope than there has been historically for the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates when that's needed in the face of the next economic downturn. All else equal, this means that there's a greater risk for short-term interest rates to in the future to be pinned again at their effective lower bound and for inflation expectations to become unanchored to the downside. Although forward guidance and large-scale asset purchases have, programs have expanded the ways in which the Federal Reserve can provide additional accommodation, 
These unconventional monetary policy tools also have their own limits. The fact that they do have limits suggests that fiscal policy may need to play a greater role in stabilizing the economy than has been the case in past decades. Now, what I have in mind here is putting in place stronger, more robust, automatic fiscal stabilizers that would provide income support during economic downturns. By reducing fluctuations in disposable incomes, these types of fiscal actions would stabilize aggregate demand, thereby, thereby limit, limiting the risk that monetary policy would get pinned again at the zero lower bound for an extended period and reducing the need for extraordinary monetary policy measures. I favor automatic rather than discretionary fiscal actions because if they were automatic, they would typically go into effect more quickly and, Im and importantly, would be better anticipated. Expectations matter greatly in terms of affecting economic behavior. For example, if the economy were to weaken, the anticipation that strong fiscal stablers would kick in to support incomes should cause workers to be less fearful about losing their jobs and businesses to be less concerned that demand for their products might fall precipitously. This in turn would make workers more confident that they could in fact sustain their spending and would make businesses more confident that they could keep workers on their payrolls. So what type of fiscal stabilizers would be most effective? Well, I'd start with those that Congress has implemented on a discretionary basis in the past, such as extensions of unemployment compensation insurance and cuts in payroll taxes. For example, one could imagine that when the unemployment rate were to climb, the duration of eligibility for unemployment compensation could be extended. And that could be happen automatically. And that would help to stabilize household income. Similarly, when the unemployment rate rose and breached certain thresholds, payroll tax cuts could be triggered automatically, helping to support the disposable income of workers who might be facing reductions in the amount of hours worked. Payroll tax cuts also have the advantage of skewing more towards low and moderate income workers who typically have a higher propensity to consume out of current income. Now, it's obviously up to the incoming administration and Congress to decide on what these appropriate fiscal measures would be. But the point that I want to highlight is that robust automatic fiscal stabilizers would be an important complement to monetary policy. And this would take some of the pressure off the Federal Reserve to undertake extraordinary measures in situations when there's little scope for further cutting short-term interest rates. This approach might also be superior to other proposals, such as raising the Federal Reserve's inflation objective from 2% to a higher number, that are designed to reduce the risk of monetary policy being trapped at the zero lower bound. Now, for such fiscal actions to be sustainable over time, it's also going to be important that the United States retain sufficient fiscal capacity for these stabilizers to actually be credible in the future. On this score, while significant progress has been made in recent years in stabilizing the country's fiscal situation, circumstances are likely to grow more challenging in the years ahead. There are three areas that I would highlight. First, the earnings that the Federal Reserve returns to the U.S. Treasury Department each year are likely to fall in the future as short-term interest rates rise and narrow the gap between what the Fed pays on its liabilities, primary, primarily currency and bank reserves, and what it earns on its portfolio of assets, treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities. In recent years, the Federal Reserve remittances to the U.S. Treasury have averaged about $90 billion per year. This is far above the 20 to 30 billion per year that we averaged prior to the Great Recession. Now, a precise trajectory of what future investments are likely to be is highly uncertain because it depends on the economy and the path of uh, interest rates in the future. But the Congressional Budget Office publishes one baseline estimate, and they project that Federal Reserve payments to the Treasury will drop from about six tenths of a percent of GDP in half to 0.3 percent of GDP over the next 10 years, between 2016 and 2026. Second, another thing that's likely to happen is that the Treasury's debt service costs will likely grow as interest rates rise, and the amount of outstanding debt held by the public continues to increase. <clears throat> While net outstanding Treasury debt held by the public has nearly tripled over the last decade to $14.2 from $4.8 trillion, 
annual debt service costs have been virtually flat. They've only increased very modestly. That's not going to be the case going forward. The CBO's baseline projection is that debt service costs will rise from, will nearly double over the next 10 years, rising from 1.4 percent of GDP in 2016 to 2.6 percent of GDP in 2026. Third, the retirement of the baby boom generation, of which I am a part, will put significant upward pressure on Social Security and Medicare expenditures. Although the trend in medical expenditures has flattened out in recent years as headline inflation has moderated and utilization growth of health care services has slowed, the Congressional Budget Office nevertheless projects that such expenditures will rise from about 3.2 percent of GDP in 2016 to about 4.0 percent of GDP in 2026. There are just going to be a lot more people that are in the Medicare program. Consequently, this means that significant pressures on the federal budget are still very much in train. So it will be important to make sure that fiscal policy is managed in a way that it retains the capacity to be used for macroeconomic stabilization. Now I want to turn to some of the structural challenges that we face. Now we've made steady progress over the past year towards our twin goals of maximum sustainable employment and price stability. But there, that doesn't mean that there aren't other significant challenges in the economy that lay largely beyond the scope of monetary policy. The three that I want to highlight today are the sharp slowdown we've seen in labor productivity growth, the increase in income inequality, and the low rate of income mobility. Now I draw attention to the slowdown in productivity growth for two reasons. First, productivity growth ultimately drives living standards in how people assess their economic well-being. And second, beyond ensuring a stable macroeconomic and financial environment, the fact is monetary policy can't do that much to improve productivity growth. Annual productivity growth has averaged only 0.7 percent during the past five years. This is near the lowest five-year pace we've seen since the early 1980s. Now there are a number of competing explanations for why we've seen such a sharp slowdown in productivity growth. These include weak capital investment, a flattening out of educational attainment by new labor market entrants, less new business formation, understatement of quality improvements and hence output, how much value people get from their iPhone, for example, and fewer groundbreaking innovations. I expect that all these factors play a role. What public policy can do to address this issue is to ensure that the economy operates closer to the frontier of what is achievable. For example, more efforts to improve job skills would prove beneficial through retraining and apprenticeship programs. And better alignment of education and training with business needs would also be helpful. Also encouraging small business startups would help by removing barriers for entrepreneurs to set up new businesses and by creating more startup incubator programs. I also suspect that a well-targeted infrastructure spending program would be advantageous if it addressed logistical bottlenecks that would enable people to better commute to areas with good job opportunities. For example, in the New York City metropolitan region, mass transit, to put it very simply, is old, slow, and crowded. As a New Jersey resident, I'm still waiting for that second set of rail tunnels into New York City that should have been built many years ago. Now, while higher productivity growth could support better living standards, the benefits for low- and middle-income households depend in part on how those gains are distributed between business and labor, and how labor income is distributed across the workforce. Moreover, income distribution shouldn't be viewed as a static concept. It is important that people are able to move upward in their incomes throughout their careers, regardless of where they started. Over the past several decades, unfortunately, three, de these, the three developments have been discouraging. First, the share of labor income relative to business income has fallen. Since 1970, the labor share of GDP in the United States has declined about five percentage points. Similar declines are evident in most developed and emerging market economies. Second, the distribution of labor income has become more skewed. Since 1970, the top 1 percent of households in terms of income distribution have more than doubled their share of national income. 
Third, despite the notion of the American dream, income mobility in the United States remains relatively low compared to many other countries. Also, and I think this is very important, the potential for income mobility is not evenly, evenly distributed. Research has shown that where you are born and raised in the United States, this is about where you live as opposed to who you are, still has significant implications for your future prospects. As a country, we do need to address these issues. With respect to the labor share of income, maintaining the U.S. economy at full employment should help. As the unemployment rate has fallen over the past two years, the labor share of income has moved up almost one and a half percentage points. Since supporting maximum sustainable employment is part of the Fed's dual mandate, the Fed can play an important role here. With respect to the rising concentration of income and the low level of income mobility, I think considerable improvements are also achievable. Income distribution can be influenced by tax policy and by educational opportunities. Income mobility can be influenced by local politics on education and housing. As Raj Chetty's path-breaking work makes clear, income mobility depends on where, on, where, on where one is born and lives. This suggests quite strongly that improved access to good education, child care, and affordable housing would help. As I noted in a recent speech, an important aspect of a city's vitality is the ability of its residents to develop the skills necessary to be successful in order to achieve their dreams. A big asset for New York City is its access to affordable education. Each year, tens of thousands of low and moderate New Yorkers send their children to one of the city's specialized high schools. When it, come time, when it comes time for college, many of these same students have access to the SUNY and CUNY systems. A recently highly regarded study assessed how much of an opportunity do children born to less advantaged families have in different parts of the United States of moving up in the world? New York City ranked 10th out of the 50 largest metropolitan areas. Now, this is better than an average performance, but I think New York City should aspire to do even better. So to conclude, while the near-term outlook for the U.S. economy is reasonably good, there is considerable work to do over the longer term to improve our nation's productive capacity and foster an environment in which these gains are spread more evenly. Monetary policy is limited in what it can do to address these broader structural issues. However, monetary policy, we will do our part to ensure that macroeconomic and financial stability can help in achieving progress in these areas. Moreover, even with respect to macroeconomic stability, monetary policy could use and assist from fiscal policy. It's important that monetary policy and fiscal policy work together and not at cross purposes to be able to bolster the economy when it needs support. Thank you for your kind attention. I'd be very happy to take a few questions. Bill, thank you uh, for uh, being here this morning and giving us uh, your insights. Um, we, we always believe in infrastructure and investment, and I'm glad you raise that issue, and, and we look forward to working with you and your team uh, to make sure that our city continues to diversify, another thing that we've been working on uh, for a long time, and uh, wish you the best of luck, and uh, hope to see everybody on the 12th. Thank you. Thank you.